Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by Lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10 day trial, visit Lynda.com slash C101. That's L Y N D A dot com slash C101. And by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code C101 in the billing section for a $10 credit. Today on Coding 101, we're revisiting the Twit API with our very own Patrick Delahanty. Hello and welcome to Coding 101. It's the Twitch show where we let you into the wonderful world of the Code Monkey and the Code Warrior. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Patrick Delahanty. And of course, joining us as always is the man, the myth, the legend. He's the Lou. That's right, a senior developing lead with Microsoft, Lou Maresca. Thank you very much for coming back to co host Coding 101. It's great to be here. Now, uh, I, I, sh I will say, for those people who were expecting this episode on Monday, we did have a little bit of a scheduling. A blip. I'll call it a blip, a burp. So we're here with Patrick to give you all the goodness on this wonderful Friday. And uh, we're going to make it up to you because we're going to give you some of the secrets of the Twit API. Now, Patrick, you were on previously to show us some basics. We built a little bit of an app that would draw from the Twit API. Uh, and, and since then, we've actually yeah. had that use in the real world. Uh, Want to talk a little bit about Apple TV? Yeah, there's four Apple TV apps, and two of them use the Twit API. So they've got, they're pulling in the current artwork, the current episodes, all the latest data. And so if you want to see the Twit API in use, it's uh, the Twit network and Twit on TV that are the two Apple TV apps using the API. Right, and, and we don't want to pick favorites among yeah. the apps. They're actually, they all, all work pretty well. But I will say that it, it does bring into real life some of the discussions we had with the chat room when we were talking about the Twit API. Because some people were saying, why would I use the API? Why wouldn't I just scrape the site? Well, yeah. if you look at the apps, you can see the differences. Because if you don't use the Twit API, you don't get the most recent album art. You sometimes <laughs> lag behind on episodes. <clears throat> and if we ever make a change to, like, for example, Coding 101 publishing on Friday instead of Monday, it could mess up your episode yeah. catalog. Or when we launch new shows or retire a show, those differences you'll get immediately. Right, so. right. So, if folks, if you're going to you're gonna program, go ahead and use the Twit API. Uh, we'll, we'll throw it in again, but how do they get a Twit API key? They can go to the Twit website at twit.tv, go to About, and under there you will see the Developer Program and API. And on that page, there are links to the documentation on Apiary, as well as 3scale.net, where you can sign up for the API. And as soon as your email address is validated, uh, you're, I get an email that there's a new developer waiting. And in one business day, I go through and grant you your key. Uh, yeah, I grant an API key. And yeah. then you're on your way to programming either apps for release or just personal stuff for yourself. And uh, one other note, you may notice if you if you look really closely, there's probably going to be an API key or two that pop up on screen. We actually destroyed those after the episode, so don't try to use it. Just go ahead and get your own. It's it's a really simple process. <laughs> uh, Lou, we've got a fun episode coming up, but I thought maybe first we might want to talk about something uh, that that I find personally inspiring. You you've heard of the Hour of Code, right? Absolutely, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's 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 an it's by code.org. It's this idea of encouraging young people, kindergartner all the way up to high school, to get into code. Specifically, they're really trying to encourage STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, among young women. Well, uh, code.org, yeah, they've already got a popular following. They've decided to get even more popular by taking advantage of the imminent release 
of a very popular movie out of a very popular franchise. Uh, Patrick, what, what movie might that be? Star Wars. <laughs> it's Star Wars. Yes. Code.org has teamed up with, uh, with Star Wars uh, to, to offer a themed lesson. Now, here's the, co the cool thing. If you visit Code.org right now, you can take a one hour long coding tutorial from Princess Leia or from Rey from Star Wars The Force Awakens. Uh, one lesson will teach you how to program a Star Wars game, and the other lesson will teach you basic programming for R2-D2, uh, C-3PO, and, and of course BB-8. Uh, uh, have you played with this at all, Lou? Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. In, in fact, what they're doing is the visual programming element of it is actually building code underneath. So if you want to go see the code that you're building, it's kind of cool. You can see it as, it, as you go through it. Right, and, and this is this is what it looks like. So you've got blocks. Uh, they've also got JavaScripts. You can use whichever one you like. It's it's a nice way to teach logic. Uh, remember, early on in coding 101, one of the things that we really tried to impress upon people is we would be sp switching languages, but the language doesn't really matter. It's learning the the logical items behind the language. Now, uh, actually, if you go ahead and go to my my machine, uh, uh, Victor, I, I want to show what this looks like. So this this is actually code.org. This is the uh, the BB-8 programming as you see it. So what we have is we have a workspace with one method right now. It's calling the function move right. Uh, what I want to do is I want to move BB-8 over to the scrap metal. So if I just ran this right now. It's only got one move right command and the mission is going to fail. But what I can do is if I take one of these blocks and I tell it move right, move right, oh, move right, and then run it, BB-8 will succeed. He'll get the scrap metal. Now, this is obviously aimed at children, but what I like about this is it becomes so visual. This is a nice way to represent uh, the, the, the chain of logic. What would I do? if I wanted to change something in the real world. So if I'm looking at this code right here, I'd want to move BB-8 to the right, to the right, then down, then down. And all I have to do is I drag over these blocks. Now, of course, this is super simplistic, but as you move on in the lessons, this will slowly get more and more complicated. It will start asking you to add parameters inside of functions, inside of calls. And uh, again, you know, anytime that you can give a child something that they can do over and over again to reinforce the lesson, it's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, Patrick, cool. uh, yeah. have you played with this at all? Yeah, I did. And uh, I moved BB-8 around, get the, <laughs> <laughs> had him collect the stuff. And I wish I had this as a kid. Right. Because I yeah. loved programming, and I always wanted to learn more. And I remember there was a game by Origin Systems, I think it was called Omega, where you actually had to program an artificial intelligence tank. And this reminds me a lot about that. And I had to, you have to learn the code to have the task mm -hmm. complete. Mm -hmm. And they, it, it works it into a game. And so it's fun. And I, I sent the link to my niece, who's 11. And hopefully she'll get into this. And maybe she'll uh, be interested in coding. There's no horses, though. so right. uh, <laughs> I, think what's, I think what's cool about it, you can actually, once you're done with it, you can actually click the show me the code button. It'll actually show you the code. My son actually liked looking at it because he oh, actually yeah. he thought that he was... Uh, actually coding right and which you actually really are you're yeah. building logic trees but you're you know you're actually you know there's code underneath going on there so it's kind of yeah neat. let's let's do that so we got to move uh, down left left down down and left and let's do this uh so that we can uh see the code after did i did i do that right let's see i think bb8's about to die here let's see oh yeah, yeah. sir messed up hey, he's still, <laughs> yeah, still, he still got there <laughs> That's some sloppy coding yeah. there, Padre. But now if I show the code, you know, it now they say, oh, okay, it wasn't just something I dragged and dropped. That's something I would actually have to type to call right. a function inside of BB-8 to make them do that, that, that actual thing. Yeah. And as you get further and further into these lessons, they'll show you more and more of the code that actually goes into the function. Right. It, it's actually, it's, you know, I wish, again, like you, yeah. I wish I had a programming class like this. Uh, the closest thing I can think of right now is uh, Little Bits. And uh, Brian Chi talked about this. Mm. They're, they're a sponsor on this network. But I love playing with it because it teaches people how to use like the the triple five oscillator, uh, yeah. and it's it's literally putting together blocks, but they're actually programming. Yeah, little bits is the uh, electrical engineering version of this. Right. Really, this yeah. is the computer science version. Go figure. Uh, now, hey, uh, Lou, <laughs> I, I almost don't want to bring up this other story, but it has been <laughs> tweeted at me so many times. I feel like we kind of have to address it. Uh, it's the <laughs> iOS bingo. There was a lot of hoopla made a week and a half back about a company, Zerodinium, 
that uh, markets zero-day vulnerabilities, and they agreed to pay out a $1 million bounty to a group of hackers who say they figured out a way to hack any iOS device that navigates to a particular site. Did, did you hear about this? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, this, this is, you know, I, I think they got what they wanted. They wanted to create a lot of buzz. They wanted to create a lot of fear. They wanted a lot of people going, oh, no, my, my device is so insecure. And yet every person on this network, from myself to Leo Laporte to Steve Gibson to yourself, Patrick, kind of look at this and shake your heads, go, this is, this is a PR grab. What's, what's your take? Yeah, I think essentially what they're trying to do is they're they're trying to uh, you know, scare agencies or, or, or corporations into paying them a dollar to 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 figure out what this zero day is and how to how to go about it, how to fix it. And really, it's not it's it's basically an exploit that's it's just they're using to sell to corporations essentially. It's not it's not necessarily a, a real threat to the world. Right, I and mean, they're they're saying it's a bounty because they're trying to take advantage of uh, the the bug bounty programs that have become very popular. In yeah. fact. We've talked about them here on Coding 101. We've had people involved in bug bounty, hunt, bug bounty hunting and bug bounty offers, both on Coding 101 and on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Uh, and it, it, just, yeah, it just strikes me as really, really slimy. I mean, uh, the, the Pangu jailbreak team even denounced this. They, they, they saw this for what it is, which is it's just a, it's a <laughs> really quick money grab. Yeah. yeah, and it's kind of screaming for the clickbait headlines yeah. for a zero-day exploit on iPhone that, uh, you know, everybody loves to print so they can get the ad impressions on their yeah. blogs. Uh, not only that, this, is, this would be the strangest bug bounty I've ever heard of because most bug bounties are trying to encourage responsible security research. And look at the Zimperium guys who found a bug, that's, this is the stage fright bug, in Android that affects hundreds of millions of devices. They could have sold right. that for a ridiculous amount of money. They ended up selling it to Google for $1,337, <laughs> which is late, <laughs> uh, because they figured, no, you know what? You want to be a responsible security researcher. Don't, don't be that guy. So this is sort of that guy. Welcome, <laughs> Zerodinium, you are that guy. Yeah, done with that? I don't yeah. really want to give them uh. any more press than they need. All right, when we come back, let's go ahead and jump straight into the Twit API. We've got some uh, tricks of the trade to show you. Patrick is going to bring you one step further than we did when we last had the Twit API on the show. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the first sponsor of this episode of Coding 101, and it's lynda.com. Now, lynda.com is the source, the place you want to go, the repository for knowledge, for information on the internet. If you've ever wanted to learn, say, Excel skills because you might be looking for a job soon, that's something you can do on lynda.com. If you want to, say, recall information about something you've already learned, a repository, say, for, uh, for your previous skills, that's lynda.com. If you want to improve your skills at taking photography or improve your word working skills or improve your programming skills, that's exactly what lynda.com is for. It's for the problem solvers, for the curious, for the people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to learn how to develop an app. Well, that's what Lynda will do for you. Lynda.com's latest additions include building a note-taking app for iOS 9 with Swift, which takes you through all the steps in developing an app for iOS 9. By the end of the course, you'll have fully developed a functional and working app. They also have versions of that course for Android and Windows Phone. And if you're looking to learn a new programming language, well, then you're going to want to check out their Code Clinic. Code Clinic is a multi-course series where lynda.com experts look at common code challenges and offer their solutions using C, C++, C Sharp, JavaScript, PHP, Python, R, Ruby, and Swift. It's an excellent resource for both aspiring and experienced coders alike. Oh, some of the things that I've really liked about Lynda is the fact that they've got transcripts for all of their episodes. So if you have a specific pro a problem that you're looking for, you don't have to watch an entire series. Just jump straight to the video that's going to help you, straight to the, the second that's got the answer to your problem, and you're done. You can stream thousands of video courses on demand and learn on your own schedule. And because you learn on your own pace, it means you learn best. They're not going to demand that you stick with their lessons. They'll let you be on your schedule, which means the information will actually stick. You also get to take notes as you go. You get to build playlists and share them with your friends so that you can experience the communal joy of learning. And once you started with Linda, you can watch it on your iOS device, on your Android device, your Mac, your PC, your laptop, your desktop. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try lynda.com. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to trading on hundreds of topics, all for one low flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new. 
I want you to visit lynda.com slash C101 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. Yep, free 10-day trial. Try it for free. That's lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C101. And we thank lynda.com for their support of Coding 101. Let's get back to it. Hey, uh, Lou, when we last left the Twit API, uh, we, we were on the verge of a functional app. I mean, we, we had learned how to, to bring in data, so we were able to bring in episode lists. We were able to download files, but uh, we kind of left it at that, right? Yeah, it's, it's fairly simple actions, but you know, we're, we're trying to get the everyone kind of get into it and try it themselves. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Patrick wanted to give us a little something more. Patrick, what, what else do we need? Uh, well, there's been a couple changes to the API, uh, or rather additions. Uh, the first thing I want to mention, and we're not really going to get into it here because it's just one little thing, uh, we added a featured flag to the episodes. So that means that uh, if we've hit a little checkbox when the editors publish an episode, it will be marked as featured. And that currently does nothing on the website, but your app or your fan site and the new Twit apps we're working on, they take advantage of that. So there's a featured, it's going to be a featured page with featured episodes. So it'll be like the highlights of the week. This is actually one of the things I like about having an API, because when you look at the change log, you kind of know what to expect in the future sites because yeah. if you've just added a brand new field. You're like, oh, I guess we're, yeah, we're breaking them out now. Up, yeah. yeah, and you know, there's other stuff in the API that's not used by anything, but maybe in the future we'll, <laughs> we'll need that. Um, so yeah, the featured uh, flag is in there under the episodes, and it's just called featured, and it has a one if it's featured. It's null if it's not. Right, right. And so maybe you'll want to put that into your Apple TV app, your iOS app, or your fan site, whatever. Uh, the other thing that has been there, well, it was added after the, after the initial API was released, but it's been there a while, and that's live streams. And we haven't really talked about that before. Right, because uh, the, in the example that we had, uh, we had the ability to draw up the episode list for a particular yes. show. Uh, actually, first we had we had the ability to drop the, the names of all the shows, then the names of all the episodes, and you showed us how you could hit the API several times to get the complete list. And we could download individual shows because we got the URLs for yep. each of those episodes, but we didn't do a live viewing feature. Why, why didn't we have that? Uh, well, originally it was just hard-coded into our site. Okay. And this is something we want to be able to uh, be able to add or remove live streams as we need to because, honestly, sometimes Ustream might go down or Twitch might go down. Maybe Big Gravity is not responding quickly. So we have this ability so that if for some reason something's not working right, we can pull it, and when people go to the site, they'll see the list of streams that work and not necessarily the ones that aren't working. Right. Um, and so uh, we added this in fairly soon after we released the API. And uh, we're able to, there's a number of settings, and the live streams from all our different providers vary greatly. So <laughs> it, it gets kind of complicated. Yeah. And so I, I figured this would be a good opportunity to go over, over that. Okay, take us in. All right, um, if we look at my screen, what I've done here is I've made a PHP script that calls the API and pulls up all the live stream data that's in the API. And I printed some of it here on the screen, just the relevant stuff. Uh, and you can see here, it's sorted into, we've got Android streams, iOS streams, all live streams, and then down here, we've got live page streams. Uh, why do we need so many? I mean, if you go to the, the, the Twit website, there's really just three options. Yeah, well, these, uh, f the four different sections here are what we call queues, at least on the back end. And so this way we can say, okay, our Android app will use these streams because these are compatible with Android. The iOS one uses these streams. They're compatible with that. The all live streams, this is kind of the kitchen sink. It's got this is everything. everything. So if, that's if that, it's if that right the there, that's list. the full list. That's every stream that's available out of RCDNs. Yes. Okay. And then at the bottom, the live page stream. So this is what once it's implemented on our website, this is what would actually be available. Can we actually see the PHP script that uh, that called this in? Yeah. Uh, so let me bring that up here. I've got uh, this PHP script. So at the top, I set the variables. And this, if you haven't seen the API before, please go back to episodes 74 and 80 through 83. And we talk about a lot of this stuff. Um, and so if you've seen those, you've 
you know what all this stuff does. So I'll get down to the interesting stuff down here. Here's the URL I call. So <laughs> you can see here it's calling pretty much the same thing everything else does in the API, but here it's calling live streams. And I set the range to 25. We're not going to have more than 25 queues. Right, um, right. So I don't have to worry about... What would be the max, though? Let, let's, let's take this to a different API that maybe for a network that had way more shows. Uh, is, is, does the API limit how many I can call? Well, it, if I'm using the API to call episodes, if it's like the twit bits, there's almost 2,000 twit bits. So I would need more than 25 <laughs> okay. pages. Fair enough. Or, or, uh, yeah. so but you're just you're calling the live streams, it. yeah. Yeah, this is the okay. live streams. We've got four different queues, so I'm calling up to 25, which is fine. Right. Um, uh, Lou, uh, you uh, you did this when we did our, our earliest episode on, uh, on APIs. Uh, and when you called back the JSON blob, I remember you saying something about you, you always tried to limit the response that you got because you didn't want too big of a blob. What was the practical limit? So I think it's, it's it depending on how large the blob is. I mean, a lot right now the data coming back from each show is not too big. So you just have to, you know, limit it to whatever you think your application. So like most apps, like if you're building an iOS app or whatnot, you have a limited amount of RAM. And so you want to stream that data in and then it, what, whether you save it to a local store or you, you know, display it somehow, you want to limit it very, you know, the specific subset of data. This way you're not taking over the, you know, the, the amount of RAM or the amount of memory that you might need or might, might be allowed for that app. Right. So I think we did, I think, I can't remember, I think it was like, 12 at a time or something like that. Uh, and we the, we the did new Jason. egg. I think it was new egg and Best Buy. I, I can't remember who we, we pulled from. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there was a whole bunch of them. But you basically, it's just called a paging technique. It's paging meaning you just page, you know, one. Yeah, whether you have 25 pages or like like uh, Patrick said, four pages, you, you pull one page at a time and then you increment and go to the next page and then you just get incrementally the data down. This way you're not storing it all at once. Right. And uh, actually, Chumley in the chat room is wondering if, oh, so this is the way that the Twit site is programmed? No. No, actually. <laughs> yeah, this is this just PHP code I threw together. Specific demo script that he to threw together just today, just yeah. so he could show <laughs> off what this looks like. Uh, you will not find any page on the Twit TV yeah. website that looks anything actually, like yeah, that. Yeah, the Twit site doesn't actually use PHP. So. so that would be kind of strange. Yeah. Uh, but okay, so what we've done, what you've, you've, yes. you've pinged the API and you've told it, I want live streams, give me the 25 that you got. You're getting back this JSON blob. We, we know from the last time we dealt with APIs, we, we started that with the key. So we needed the yep. key. Then we needed the request. Now we've got the JSON blob. Now we need to parse the JSON blob so that it makes sense. Yeah. And so I've got here a uh, JSON viewer that's uh, in Hungary or something, .hu, wherever that is. But it's a really good viewer. It's at uh, jsonviewer.stack.hu. Uh, what was the one that you liked, Lou, uh, your JSON blob viewer? Um, that was, that's a good question. I think it was a JSON converter or Something basically like that. that you convert it to objects. Right. I, I was using one uh, until recently when my JSON was too large to fit in that viewer. <laughs> and I found this one and it's been working on any okay. size I throw at it. We'll, so. st we'll stick with this one. So show us. So you're taking the JSON and it's going to populate the fields for us, yeah. correct? So okay. it's nice. got, uh, it says count four, the live streams, and we'll look at live stream two, which is all live streams. I actually can, uh, uh, well, just for the folks who maybe need a refresher course on the JSON mm -hmm. blob, is do you have a quick way to just pull in the JSON blob to show them what it looks like when it comes back? Looks like that. They, exactly. So this <laughs> this is what we mean by parsing, folks. Yeah. You could, if, if you were really dedicated and you had access to no tools, you could go through this line by line, separate the fields, and figure yeah. out what data was returned to you. That would be ridiculous because we have these, these really fantastic JSON parsers that will take a blob, and they'll say, oh, yeah, it looks like you've got this, 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 and this field, so you can call this yeah. this bit of information. Like, you could look at this and say, oh, IceCast <laughs> Audio, the stream source, here it's at this viewer. But no, it's much easier to use an actual yeah, viewer. Yeah, just use a viewer. So it's all yeah. organized nicely. Well, like, and there's a lot of there's a lot of libraries out there, whether it would matter, you know, depending on what language you're using, JavaScript's got a library, eSharp's got JSON.net. So you, you, you'll you be able to parse it, you know, using the libraries rather than having to write your own parser, no matter what language you're in. So. Yeah. If you're ever parsing by hand, uh, you're working too hard. Don't don't do it. You, yeah, exactly. Every, you can. You could do it. You told. I know you could do it. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. All right. So we've got our blob. Where do I go from here? Uh, so I, I've got the live streams in here, and you can see live stream one here is the iOS streams. It's uh, live stream two is all live streams. So these are pretty much what I had on my page here, and so I'm just taking that data and. Putting it in HTML, right? Uh, but 
We can actually go into one of the live streams here. So here's Ustream. Oh, how about that? And uh, if I scroll down So here. can you explain, yeah, so explain these fields? So, oh look, there we are. Oh. <laughs> uh, so uh, this has an ID. Don't, don't press play, no. it'll be codeception. <laughs> uh, it labels it, it has a time to live. Um, clean path, this is just Ustream that's uh, stream source. So if you want, if you needed the M3 U8 URL, that's oh, here. Oh, we, wait, we set a, a stream preferred switch? There is. Uh, this is kind of like the featured that we added to oh. the episodes. Stream Preferred tells you that this is our preferred stream for that format. So now, why, why do we do that? Uh, well, here the stream type is video. Stream Preferred is true. That means for video, Ustream is our preferred stream, which when you go to the Twit site, Ustream comes up first. Okay. Uh, and if for some reason Ustream was having trouble, we might go change it. Oh, now BitGravity is preferred. Now maybe... Uh, something else, okay. uh, Twitch. I, I also noticed that there, you, you had a null there for for stream resolution. Is that just so it will just take whatever the stream resolution and just play it? Uh, well, like I, I mentioned earlier, we don't have the same data for all of the stream right. providers, and you stream just kind of you know whatever size it is, mm -hmm. it's what you get. They've got the one thing, so. And so oh, so if you had like a, a provider that was transcoding. You yeah. actually have or, to specify what you want it to come out as. And, and Big Gravity, I actually do have the sizes mm -hmm. because they've got high and low and they have specific uh, sizes set. We blind me in the chat room saying, hey, how come Ustream is preferred? Flowsoft is the best. Uh, that, you know, it's, it, I know this is, this is supposed to be a, a funny And, and now people on, are comment. arguing which is the best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but this, this is important because whenever you're developing an app or developing an API or choosing how you're going, going to attach to an API, you're, you're going to run into this. How, do, how did we determine these are the providers we're going to use, these are the streams that we want, this works best with our content? Uh, that was before I got here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they do have, uh, they have talked to these providers and so... Ustream is our preferred provider. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> uh, Lou, what, when you're playing with APIs, I mean, because I mean you do it on a daily basis, uh, what what are you looking for? Defining characteristics of a user-friendly API versus an API that probably has no documentation and is almost impossible to program for. You know, any REST API, you're always looking for something that's self-explanatory. Like, for instance, you know, if I wanted to call twit.tv slash shows slash show name, that's a really easy API because it allows me to 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 query, you know, and inherently understand what I'm doing. And then there's some APIs that, you know, they'll have some parameters on the end of it. They really have no clue what they do. And the nice thing is this, this API is well documented, too, so it actually helps you out. And then when you get back, whatever data you get back, sometimes it has a, a schema that you don't even understand. So it's, you know, the good APIs are the ones that are, um, you know, that, that are self-explanatory. When you look at them, you're like, oh, yeah, I understand the data that's coming back, and I understand the structure, and I understand how to query it. Uh, and, and then, like, Pat, even the really good APIs, like Patrick was explaining, is ones that you can expand and not have to take stuff away, but expand and not really screw anybody else up. So, if, you know, like he added the feature flag onto there and it still allows other people who are currently using the API to continue to use it or take advantage of the new version of it and use that feature flag. So I think those are the ones it's, um, you know, close to change but open for extension kind of thing. And that those are really good APIs. Gentlemen, I want to continue with this. I want to keep talking about the Twit API. Oh, we've we've still got plenty to go. So oh, yeah. you, you brought back an episode. And actually, if you go to a screen, because I, what I like about this, this does show you that we are pulling from the API, because that's right now. That's yeah. We just started. <laughs> it, this This is not pulling it, from the catalog. It's the freeze frame from, uh, from Ustream when I first loaded this page. Exactly. So, so this this is really going to be pulling from the stream. It's It's... Doesn't look beautiful, of course, because he didn't code it to be beautiful. But uh, we're well. gonna we're gonna explore how to make this happen on your app. But before we do that, would you guys mind if I take a little bit of a break? Because I want to thank the second sponsor of Coding 101. Is that okay? Yeah, let's absolutely. do that. Okay. Uh, uh, before I thank them, I, I want to ask you something. When you develop your app, when you develop your service, when you try to put together the, the servers and and the applications that you want to push out to the world to announce your presence, how do you do it? Well, if you did it the old way, it means that you would buy space in a colo. You'd probably have to buy the hardware because, you know, if you want to control your hardware. You're definitely going to want to hire someone to maintain it, update it, because, you know, th that's your presence. You can't have it be an old version of the software or, or non-updated version of, say, a financial transaction software. 
you could do all that along with getting an agreement with an ISP and making sure that, uh, well, everything works even when you're not there. But that would just be silly. That's so much work. That is so pre-2000. Nowadays, we have DigitalOcean. Now, DigitalOcean is the place to go if you've got an app, a service, something that you want to scale up into your full-blown production. DigitalOcean uses droplets, which is an easy way for you to encapsulate private servers, websites, apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, pretty much everything else that you can think of. And here's what I like, it gives you full root access. DigitalOcean is built for developers by developers, and it's used by over 400,000 of them, including me. You get to deploy and configure your droplets via a streamlined control panel or an API. You choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, and FreeBSD. Then you have a one-click install to let you deploy apps like Django, Docker, Drupal, LAMP, GitLab, MediaWiki, Node.js, WordPress, Ghost, Magento, OwnCloud, Ruby on Rails, and more. All their hardware is built on hexcore machines with dedicated ECC memory and RAID SSD storage, and their servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigabytes of memory, and 640 gigabytes of SSD super fast storage space. They're highly scalable. You can start with a single machine for a single app. Maybe you, you want to beta it to just your friends. Get, get a little bit of traffic to see how it's going to survive the real world, and then with the click of a button, move it up to worldwide deployment. That's what I love about DigitalOcean. They understand that sometimes you want to grow quickly and sometimes you just need to show that you can do it. You get full feature DNS management with easy to manage domains using dedicated IPs. You can deploy servers in regions all around the world with gigabit speeds and 99.99% .99 uptime. You can deploy, you can clone, you can resize all of your droplets and they'll even take care of the backups for you. In other words, this is like management in a box. And they're extremely active community with a large and detailed set of tutorials on all the ways you can use your droplets means that you'll always have the answers for using DigitalOcean to your best effect. It's so easy to get started, you can be up and running with your own SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to try DigitalOcean. They've got incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing, with servers starting at just $5 per month. There's also hourly pricing available, starting at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so that you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter the promo code C101 for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do for you. That's DigitalOcean.com, DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code C101 in the billing section for a $10 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Coding 101. Patrick, what's next? Uh, um, I just wanted to show off one more thing in the uh, JSON that was returned here, right. and it is the, the stream embed. And that actually returns HTML so if you have a web page, you could just put that on there and you'd have a player. Mm. And so for all of the providers that have it, I think there's one that doesn't have an embed, and I think that's Icecast. But for all of the providers that have it, we have an embed here, put it on a web page, play it. Uh, and so if you have an app, an embed may not work. Maybe the Ustream embed won't work in your app. So the other alternative is we've got the uh, uh, stream source URL, which you can call in a player. Okay, got it. Um, so what I've got here, I've got the four queues. There's the Android streams, iOS, live streams, and the uh, live page streams. Um, the Android streams, somebody had pointed out in the chat, like, I didn't know Android could play RTMP. Well, we're currently developing the Android app. <laughs> Uh, I've thrown, we, we wanted it in there. Because, I've thrown yeah. everything at the developers, and they, they've been testing the individual ones and just telling me which ones work and which ones don't, because I have an iPhone. so. <laughs> but yeah, it does do HLS, and, but we're, we're, we're uh, working at the details there. Works on uh, the iOS phone. is apparently good to go. Uh, the live streams, as I mentioned, is the kitchen sink with everything, and live page is what we'd like to be on the Twit site. Um, and so if you want 
any of these individually, and you don't want to have to call the entire list of all the queues and right. all the live streams. Let, let's make that very clear. So you did this. You did yes. this call because you wanted to see what was available. But yeah. they don't. There's no. You don't have to give a list of every stream available in your app. Uh, yeah, yeah. You don't need to call. <laughs> just, like, just the one doing, that you want. If you're doing an iOS app, or I assume the Apple TV would use the same same list. You don't need to call everything. You can just call that one list, and so. The code here, uh, it was live streams, uh, but you could have the URL with a slash and then the ID of the particular stream you wanted to get. Ah. So um, I have one actually prepared. I've already coded that, so here I'm just returning the all live streams queue. So I don't care what the others are, just give me that one list, I don't need all the repeats. And so this returns everything. We've got a good question in the chat room from Blimey. I uh, want to mm -hmm. know if, uh, do you know if any of the, the Twit app developers have decided to open source, open source their code? Uh, a couple of the yep. fan developers have done they, they open have. source. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, as the, Windows, the, the Windows Phone one's open source. Oh, nice. As for the official yep. apps, I'm not sure if a decision's been made on that yet. Mm. That's up to Leo. That's true. Okay. So we'll see. Um, but they're to. still being coded, so we've got to get that done first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if I actually click on these, like I can click on Ustream, and I've got another page here. This is a video from Ustream. I'm not going to play it because we'll just yeah, end up. This, but this hey, look, not, there's my we screen. Want, we don't want infinite Yeah, so trust here. me, this would play. Uh, I can go back, and let's try TuneIn. And so it gives me the player the embedded player for TuneIn Radio. OK, so uh, that, that actual link, that page, is that something that was given to me by the JSON blob, or is that something you developed around an entry you got from the JSON uh, blob? I developed this page, okay. which would show, it just prints, this is the. So what do you get from the JSON blob? Is it an embed link, or what, what's returned? Uh, it, embed is one of the things returned. Remember got when it. I had the JSON up and I showed, it had the Ustream mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. That was actually from the embed. OK, OK. Uh, so what I did here is I've got this play.php page that I made, and that says, this is a blank stream from blank. And let me go load the code from that. Oops, that's not the control key. Sure. Yes, I use Emacs. I'm not <laughs> judging. Some people are, I know. L I always get judged. Lou is totally judging right now. All right, yeah. so what I did here, <laughs> I called streams and then the stream ID. So Got it. in one case, it might be the ID for the Ustream stream or the Icecast stream or whatever. Can you show us the uh, the streams field from the JSON blob just really quickly? I know I know it's kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, I have a line here I can uncomment to show the actual JSON response because I thought you might ask. <laughs> so it's <laughs> uncommented. I'll reload this. And uh, it's a mess because there's HTML yeah, in there, yeah, but if I view mess. the source, there it is. here's all this stuff. So that's what came back in the JSON blob. That's what you're putting in that entry. Yeah, okay. so you can see here, this it's not too long. It's it, not bad, no. It's got, uh, where does it end? Frame, ends I love frames. Yeah, so the, the Spreaker one happens to be in a frame in there in bed. Right. So that's, and you can put that into the viewer and it would show the, uh, the nice formatting. But it just returns this one stream. So although you do get all the streams when you view everything as a whole, and it gives you all the information. So you could conceivably put all the embeds on one page mm -hmm. and start playing them all and watch every stream at once <laughs> if you were <laughs> if, insane. Uh, if you like your but, browser crashing. It, yeah. <laughs> but you could also just call that, like, <laughs> oh, I just need Ustream. Call that one thing. It will pull the embed from our API. Mm -hmm. Or if you need the uh, stream source, if you just want the URL for your own player, you, maybe you've using JW player, your app has its own player, what, whatever the case may be. You can right. put that in there. Oh, this is nice. So I mean, this, uh, and again, we will make his code available on the website. I know we have been having issues. In fact, we, we still have issues with the code from the first PowerShell series. I, that, don't, don't get me started. I'm not sure what's going on with that. But we will make sure that his code ends up available as a downloadable link so that if you want to play with this, yep. again, it's not beautiful, so yeah. make it oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah, I put this together real quick. But you could easily use this to make your own little fan site player. Say, hey, yeah. load, load, make your own chooser for whatever live stream you want and keep it to yourself and have your own little player. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, plenty of options here. And uh, the one more thing I want to mention on this uh, 
on this page I've got here, the bold ones are the preferred streams. So, and the, we that was just a decision that was made that we want those. We, yeah, we that's, like that's those. just. Icecast okay. is the, the audio stream we've been using. Does that forever. do any? And do we? I mean, is there a, is there a flag for the, the the preferred stream that we actually use on the website, or uh, is that just yeah. there? Yeah, it's. Uh, oh, on the the website currently doesn't. It doesn't. Use it's this, there. I know it it's there. We it saw it. Will. We saw the flag. But but yeah, I'm just yeah, wondering yeah, if we're flag. actually using the flag. N not yet. The no. apps do, uh, and the site will. Okay. So. Lou, what about it? I mean, this so we could we could easily use this knowledge for a C sharp module or a Swift if we wanted to get back into Swift. Uh, your your usage of the Twit API have you have you been able to hammer around with it at all? I, I I got my API key a while back, but I will admit I I haven't really messed around under the hood. Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually have a little reoccurring app that will schedule download of some of the like kind of like a podcaster almost it will download the videos when i want it and push it to my to, to my drive online i can play it from anywhere fantastic yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised nobody's made a coding 101 fan site uh, out of the twit api yeah use the twit api pull the coding 101 <laughs> episodes all the guest info and everything's in there no, don't do that don't, all right don't, fine don't do that although i would like to see an app that pulls out all the names of all the guests that we've had that would be cool uh Actually, I, I it's on the site. I, I know, have, but I want to no, see someone I, actually do it. I, I have done that. I can show you later. <laughs> Man, that's just well, nothing fun anymore. You know, you want to see the list of all the guests, and it has them alphabetically. All I did was, well, it's really easy. You use the API. You go to the guest part, and you just pull the list, and there's all the guest names. Uh, it has everybody from when the new site went live, and then select ones from back in the day. It was it, the importing was got it. Yeah, right, it, yeah. it was an issue importing because we didn't the, have the pre-site and post-site. We've kind of yeah. have a, we have a clear marker in in our network now. Yeah. Well, uh, gentlemen, do, is there anything else that we need to uh, let them know? Uh, quick updates to the Twit API, or are we going to let your code speak for us? I guess I guess that's <laughs> it. Uh, Lou Maresca, of course, we want to thank you. Uh, I I love doing this show with you. I, I know this one we kind of let you lay back a little bit because we had Patrick here in studio. But could you tell the folks where they can find you all over the interwebs? Absolutely. You can always find me on Twitter at uh, LouMM. And, of course, all my work at Microsoft is found at crm.dynamics.com. Yeah, and that's Lou Maresca, again, a senior software development lead with Microsoft. Uh, you see him here on the Twit TV network. He's often on This Week in Enterprise Tech. He is my co-host here on Coding 101. And he's been on Before You Buy, so he's slowly... He's getting more and more. Uh, I, I do have you scheduled. I think we're going to try to get you onto a, like a TN2 or a TNT, so you'll be cool. making the rounds. Uh, Patrick Delahanty, I pass by your little closet, your coding closet, <laughs> every every day walking into the studio. Yeah, uh, sometimes with food. Sometimes, uh, well, sadly, most of the time with food. Uh, well, that, you gave me a brownie the other day, so that was nice. <laughs> oh, you ate that? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. Okay. Why are you so loopy? That wasn't chocolate? No. While you can still uh, <laughs> talk, do you want to tell the folks where they can find you and your work? You do some interesting things, and, and uh, your wife does as well, I believe. Yeah. Well, she's got her book out. It's uh, Awkward by Svetlana Chimkova, and you can find that on Amazon. Please buy it. It's doing really well. And, uh, yeah, my stuff, it's all on adequate.com. So if you go to adequate.com, it has links to all the sites I'm involved with in one way or another. And uh, yeah, this the latest thing that was posted is the AnimeCon's TV review of SnafuCon in Sparks, Nevada. Someone asked so. me, asked me to describe your work. I said, uh, "Have you ever considered yourself strange, weird, or otherwise zonky?" And if so, then yeah, this is something you'll like. <laughs> yeah, go figure. Oh, uh, you can find me, uh, of course, on Twitter, twittercom SJ. If you want to see what we're going to be doing every week on Coding 101 or any of the shows I do here on the Twit TV network, that's the best way to contact me. Especially if you have guests for future episodes. Uh, we we have been getting a lot of people who are wondered what happened to our PowerShell. Uh, module, we split it. Remember, we, we had two episodes at the beginning and then we had four weeks in between and another two episodes coming up. That will be coming up next week. So if you want to see Sarah Dukevich, I said that correctly, uh, make sure yeah. to stop by next week for Coding 101. We want to thank everyone here who makes the show possible. Of course, to Lisa and Leo for letting us do Coding 101. To uh, Patrick Delahanty, to Lou Maresca, this guy, this this the space monkey back here, and uh, our our emergency technical director today, uh, Victor. Victor, do you have a, a microphone on? You could say hi to the people. I have a microphone, but not a camera. But okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. That's, he looks great. Trust us. Yeah, he really does. That's Victor. He's uh, he pushes all of our buttons, and he's he's probably the nicest person. 
He's the only really nice person here at Twit TV. Go figure. <laughs> what? No, I stand by that statement. Until next time, I am Father Robert Balasare. He's Patrick Delahanty. He's Lou Maresca. And Lou, how do we end the show? End of line. <laughs>